And can I first of all thank you all for attending and welcome everybody to this first and unique meeting of the Executive Cooperative. Um, Executive, it is with um, great pride that we are able to uh, deliver this first meeting in person in the Council Chambers and I'd like to thank everybody for um, getting us to this point where we are able that now as an executive uh, to move business forward uh, for Sheffield City Council. Um, I'd like to say that uh, my name is uh, Councillor Terry Fox. I'm the leader of the council and later on in the programme I will get all executive members to introduce themselves. Uh, the meeting today is open to the public, although there is a reduced room capacity to ensure a COVID secure environment and that social distancing is being properly observed. The meeting is and will be live cast, uh, webcast live and the recording and will also be available for people to view later through the council's website. Can I please request that all mobile telephones and other such equipment are switched off or to silent mode so as not to disturb the conduct of the meeting. There is no fire test planned for today and if there is an emergency evacuation, please take instruction from the town hall staff. The assembly point is Tudor Square. I'm now going to ask each cooperative executive member in turn to introduce themselves and their portfolio. Uh, can I introduce Julie? Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Councillor Julie Grillcutt. I'm the ward member for Stocks, Bridge and Updon and the executive member for Community Engagement and Governance. Thank you, Julie. Douglas? Thank you, uh, thank you, Chair. I'm Douglas Johnson. I'm a councillor for City Ward. I'm also the leader of the Green Group, and I'm the cabinet member, sorry, the executive member, because we're in a new era now, and the executive member for climate change, the environment, and transport. Thanks very much. Thank you, Douglas. Jane? Uh, councillor Jane Dunn for Salvi Ward, member for education, children, and families. Thank you, Jane. Alison? Thank you, Chair. Um, Alison Teal, um, Councillor for Netheredge and Sharrow, and Executive Member for Sustainable Neighbourhoods, Wellbeing, Parks and Leisure. Thanks, Alison. Paul? Thanks, Julie. Um, I'm Councillor Paul Wood, I'm the local member for the Woodhouse Ward and the executive member for Housing, Roads and Waste Management. Th th thanks, Paul. Uh, and next, uh, George. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm George Norris Hammond. I'm a councillor for Hills Ward and the executive member for Health and Social Care. Thanks, George. Kate. Thanks, Kate. And Paul. Thank you, Chair. I'm Paul Turpin, Green Councillor for Gleekless Valley Ward and the Executive Member for Inclusive Economy, Jobs and Skills. Thanks, Paul. Ne next item on the agenda is apologies for absence. Have we received any apologies? I've got apologies from Councillor Mazaripa. Thank you. I item three, exclusion of press and, uh, public and press. I believe we haven't got any. No items. Thank you. Next item, item four, declarations of interest. Have we got any declarations of interest? And if so, on what item of business? Julie. Thank you, Chair. Can I declare a personal interest in item 10, please, which is the Stocksbridge Town Fund, as I am a member of the Townsend Fund Board. Thank, thank you, Julie. Item five is the minutes of previous meeting. Uh, I ask members to approve as a correct record the minutes of the meeting on the cabinet on the 17th of March. To have them approved. Thank you. Item six, there is one question from the members of public, Mr Nigel Slack, 
Um, I will ask Nigel if he'd like to come and ask his question, and it's nice to see you in person, Nigel. Thank you. Can we get Nigel a, a, a microphone? Thank you, Chair. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting to be back in the council chamber um, after over a year, and I hope the new executive won't take it wrong when I say I will be no less challenging in my questions for the next 12 months as I was for the previous. So, to my question for today. The University of Sheffield seems not to share the commitment of the residents of this city to providing a firm basis for higher education. In May, the university decided to close its archaeology department. This at a time when there is already a crisis in the availability of these highly skilled jobs. The demand for archaeological expertise to service major infrastructure projects has grown and it has a major role in ensuring our culture and heritage is not lost to uncontrolled development. From Iron Age sites to Victorian industrial heritage, new infrastructure and developments are threatening local historical sites. The number of graduates entering the profession has been in decline, and Brexit will make it unlikely that external candidates can be recruited to fill the roles needed. Archaeologists are indeed one of the skilled worker shortage list professions identified by the government. Commercial archaeology units cannot recruit fast enough. And the university's excuse that the demand for the subject is declining has been described by one commercial archaeology unit as absolutely false and total garbage. The university is putting a world-renowned department in jeopardy for the sake of its big business agenda. The archaeology department provides expertise across the country, from Stonehenge to our own Sheffield Castle, and its loss would diminish the standing of the university as a seat of learning and damage the reputation of the city of Sheffield as a centre of the knowledge economy. What steps will the City Council take to challenge this decision? In line with a commitment to skilled jobs within the city and to supporting the arts, culture and heritage economy. And what will the City Council do to tackle one of the underlying causes of this issue, the government's slashing of humanities education funding by 50%, thereby encouraging the creation of generations of narrow focus work fodder rather than all round well educated citizens of a modern city. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Nigel. And as always, we wouldn't expect anything else than to be challenged. Thank you. Um, who's answering these? This question, Councillor Jane Dunn. Jane? Thank you, Mr. Slack. Sorry, I can't look at you and speak into the uh, microphone, but nice to see you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I share your disappointment, Mr. Slack, and I also share the disappointment of how little, if none, well, no influence at all that, the, we, or that we can have over telling or influencing in advance education regarding the universities. Um, I can't express how upset I am about the closure. Um, you've actually identified all the reasons why that the university have actually de decided to take this course of action. Um, I've only actually received one email, but I have been, in, but despite that, as soon as I received the one email, I did go into get into conversation immediately with officers to ask them about this. And I've actually been in touch with Paul Blomfield, who I know has been in a lot of conversation with the university. The one thing that he reassured me of is that those specialist niche areas of the course have been absorbed into other courses. Now, that is a little... It's consolation, isn't it, Mr. Slack? But it isn't what we want. It isn't the way that we want to go. And it's certainly, unfortunately, now we're seeing the erosion of basically Tory annihilation of our education system and how, and how it's narrows. No university, no teaching establishment should ever be in a place where it can only deliver something because it, is, it makes money. 
because that isn't what education is about. I will give you my personal commitment, as you know, which I did before when I, fought, when I fought on the school funding, is that I will fight for a broad curriculum as someone who benefited from that um, myself. I will fight for that all the way. But unfortunately, I can't, we don't have any, you know, influence that I can actually stop them from doing this. Um, but I am reassured that those niche areas will continue because it's how we will thrive as a city. And it's really, really sad. But um, I support what you say, but unfortunately, I don't have that power or influence. Thank you. Right, thanks, Jane. And thank, thanks again, Nadia. Yeah. I just thought it's worth putting on the record because I really support everything that Council of Dunn have just said. It's a really important issue. It's quite right to recognise it's the university's decision to close this department. It's not ours. It wouldn't be our decision. But it's, it's not our decision. But I, I do want to say that um, from the point of view of the environment, there is a huge overlap between the academic study of archaeology about looking at the environment over the ages and about the human interaction with changes in the environment. And the, the, the loss of um, archaeology knowledge and skills and the people that the university attracts to the city is something that you know, will have a very detrimental effect on the city um, over the longer term. Um, so, so that's my interest. Um, but I should also say that um, along with the um, executive member for jobs and skills, as well as me and my role as executive member for the environment, we have already asked the university management uh, for a meeting to discuss this. Um, and so we hope that we'll be able to have that meeting at some point. We're waiting for the university to arrange a meeting there. And, and of course, although the university has indicated that they intend to close the department, no final decision has been made. And I'm sure that you know, we'll all be working on this to see um, what happens before a final decision is made through their process. We'll just add that. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Rose. Thank you. Um, on now to item seven, delivering for our communities, developing a one-year plan for Sheffield recovery. Um, the presenting officer, Chief, our Chief Executive, Kate Joseph. Thank you, Chair. Um, as you say, it's a historic first meeting, and personally for me, it's my first in person since arriving as Chief Exec in January, so it's lovely to be here in the Council Chamber. I'm really pleased to be able to present this paper, and I'm grateful to officers across Sheffield City Council who've contributed. The focus of the paper is on how we as a council deliver the ambitions of this new administration for the city, its communities, and its citizens. It starts critically by recognising the unique context we are in and have been in. Um, while we are making tentative steps to recovery, we are still coming out of a historic global pandemic. We mourn the loss of thousands and we recognise the immense toll this pandemic has brought on our young people, our communities, businesses, the public sector and voluntary and community sector, whose teams have worked so hard. That includes many, many staff, thousands of staff in Sheffield City Council, for whom I'm personally very grateful. Equally, we celebrate and acknowledge the feats of kindness, collaboration and brave new ways of working that we've seen, including from many Sheffield City Council teams in service of our city over this last year. And so it's from that foundation that we face both huge challenges and huge opportunities. Um, so that we recover and rebuild and renew from the pandemic and also so we respond to those challenges and opportunities, many of which are set out in the commitments in the cooperative agreement um, that has been published whether that's a new approach to community safety, um, implementing action on the pathway to net zero, whether it's about tackling long-standing inequalities in our city that have been laid bare by COVID, or levelling up to ensure a strong, inclusive local economy. So in that context, a clear, prioritised one-year recovery plan is really, really critical. There are three reasons why it's so critical. Firstly, we need to provide clarity, shape and direction for our organisation of 8,000 staff over the coming year. Secondly, a clear, prioritised one-year recovery plan will create the conditions for proper, sustained implementation and impact. So we're not spreading our resources and our efforts and our energy too thinly, and we're focusing on delivering real, tangible impact for our city. And thirdly, it will provide clarity to our partners and, most importantly, to the public on the focus of the Council um, to facilitate both greater engagement and accountability. So the report therefore recommends that we produce a one-year plan and we'll present that at the July Cabinet meeting. Um, and it's also really clear in here that that plan needs to recognise the critical importance of core, excellent council services. 
so we make sure that we're really doing our core work well and imp driving improvements in services where customers and residents have told us we're not meeting their expectations. The report also speaks to the intention that that one year plan can't be a once and done, it needs to lay the foundations or be a springboard if you like to longer term impact and change delivered in partnership across the city. Finally, the last section of the report recognises that work is needed to ensure that our Sheffield Council, our organisation, our one team is best placed to deliver the action and the ambition that the executive, um, uh, the cooperative executive has set out. So we will be setting out in this plan, we recommend that we set out in this plan, priority actions to build the capability of our organisation and ensure we're a council that our staff, our members, partners and most importantly the citizens of Sheffield can be proud of. Since my arrival in January, I've tried really hard within the constraints of, um, of COVID to engage and listen to staff, members, citizens, and that listening won't stop. But the paper summarises the five key areas that have been identified as necessary to build the capability we need in Sheffield City Council. So very, very quickly, they are firstly, clear direction and collective leadership, including through this proposal for a plan, but also through citywide collaboration with partners on a longer term blueprint for the city, and also strong leadership on the big challenges we face, like the climate emergency. Secondly, we know that as a council, we need to be more connected to our communities and citizens. This has been, this is a very clear priority um, in terms of the creation of local area committees. Um, working for, for council officers, that means we need to be working in the open, with and alongside people, visible and accessible, and it includes transforming the diversity of our workforce as a council, so we are more representative of the communities we serve at all levels. Thirdly, we need to be collaborative, building open and trusting relationships and acting as one organisation. Fourthly, we need to be confident and outward looking, sharing our successes because there really are some, especially over this last year, but also being a strong, active partner in the region, across the north and across core cities, and looking to learn from the best, and being humble in our, in our strive to learn from the best. And then fifthly and finally, we need to be absolutely rigorously committed to excellence, building a strong performance culture across the council, and taking urgent steps, as mentioned before, to improve customer services, where, um, services to customers where we need to. This obviously is a very ambitious and it is long term and large scale um, in terms of its um, ambition around organisation renewal, but we need to make a start this year. And so that one year plan needs to include, again, prioritised actions that get us on the way to, to transform the organisation. I'll finish just by thanking again um, all of our colleagues in the Sheffield City Council who've done so, so much this year. But most particularly, um, uh, sorry, all of our colleagues across the, across the city who've done so much, but most particularly Sheffield City Council staff. Um, I know that the pride they have in the, in the city that we serve, the passion they have for public service, and the determination for us to be the very best council we can be, is what will get us where we need to be. Thank you. Th th thanks, Kate. Um, thanks for that report. Um, any questions, comments? Julie? If I could just comment, please, Chair. Um, I think it's important that we um, thank the Chief Executive Officers for putting this paper together. It is a very ambitious proposal, which I think, you know, sets the City Council on the right path moving forward over the next 12 months um, and beyond. I think it's also right that we have in there information in relation to the great work that officers and staff in the Council have done along with members over the last 12 months in working towards our COVID recovery and the response to that. I think Sheffield people have been fantastic in terms of following the government guidance, which has got us to the point that we're at now. Um, and I would just make a plea for people of Sheffield to continue to follow the guidance so that you know, restrictions can continue to move in, in, in the right way and we can follow the government roadmap. I think that that is really, really important. Um, the five proposals in the um, document as I say, are very ambitious. They set a really good way forward in terms of rethinking the way that we as a council do business. Um, I look forward to working with officers and members in terms of the introduction of the local area committees and the transition committees. Following the referendum, this will put our communities across the city at the heart of everything that we do. And I know that that's something clearly as the new executive that we want to do. And certainly, um, as I speak to members, it's something that they are keen to engage in and make sure that we get this right. I don't underestimate the amount of work that will go into doing that. 
Um, there is a lot of hard work, but that again is to be welcomed. And I think that this agenda paper um, outlines a really good, positive and ambitious plan for us to follow to get us to where we want to be as a city council. So thank you for everyone involved. Thanks, Julie. Any more comments, questions? If not, I'd just like to say that I also feel proud that this cooperative executive has put party politics to one side. We're putting Sheffield first and we're going to deliver for our communities. I'm just proud of the way that Sheffield has stood together and the way that we have supported each other through this pandemic. Proud of the way the staff of this organisation of our council have managed to deliver essential services throughout this city. And it now is incumbent on us on how Sheffield recovers from the COVID-19. And it will be fundamental for the well-being and the prosperity of this city. It presents a major opportunity to capitalise on the city's strengths and to work together to plan and take action to tackle those long-standing inequalities but also to address the future challenges, not only of this city, but of the generations in front. I think we've got a real opportunity. And as a cooperative executive, I welcome this report. Uh, we've got a number of recommendations in this report. Can we approve those? Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, item eight, Sheffield COVID business recovery plan, uh, phase one. Is that, is that you, Ben? Thank you, Ben. Can you introduce yourself and then the, the report? Yes, hello. I'm Ben Morley, Head of Programme the Accountable Body in City Growth. Um, just two things before I start. Feeling slightly nervous because it's the first time I've been back at work physically since March. And, and secondly, uncomfortable because my trousers are no longer the right size. So um, if I breathe in, it's because I need some air. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, this report was prepared by my colleague, um, Diana, the author of the, the report, um, and reflects a huge amount of hard work she's put in since returning from maternity leave uh, to get uh, to where we are in terms of this first phase of, of recovery. Um, so I'm not going to take any credit for, for, the, for the paper itself. Um, she's now on much needed leave. Um, as you're aware, um, the council uh, approved the recovery plan um, through Cabinet back in, back in October, uh, a plan which was developed jointly by council staff and the business recovery group, a collection of private sector um, representatives, um, which really identified a need uh, for the council to intervene where appropriate to re-stimulate recovery, encourage its businesses and increase confidence in the city as, as we recover from the pandemic. This paper sets out a, a number of interventions now being proposed and, and being delivered um, in re direct response to the recovery plan. Um, I'll try and run through these relatively briefly because um, there's quite a number of different interventions. But just, just in terms of slight context, um, obviously the city's suffered significantly as, as has um, the global economy as a result of um, COVID. There are signs of recovery as, as we reopen up, um, although our unemployment levels remain um, higher than, than they were pre-pandemic. Um, but we are starting to see an increase in vacancies, which really much reflects the opening up of the economy, particularly in the hospitality uh, sector. So there's opportunities there, um, and this paper certainly starts to promote the activity which will support and sit alongside those, those uh, activities. Um, and also, this proposal, these proposals are in the context of the Council providing over £200 million worth of grants to local businesses over the past 12 months, um, largely core grants to ratepayers, but also some discretionary grants as well, uh, funded uh, directly by government. Turning to the proposals within the paper, um, I'll try and deal them one by one. So the first area of activity being proposed is um, promoting uh, a set of uh, events and activities uh, being marketed under the summer in the outdoor city. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of the outdoor city campaign, which we had uh, up and running two, three years ago now. This is very much now highlighting the opportunity um, which presents itself this summer 
Um, and, and I should uh, add that all these proposals have been run past um, our public health team um, to make sure that they are not uh, contributing to an, anything negatively in terms of, of COVID activity. So a range of activities are being um, promoted under the outdoor city, um, which will attract footfall into our district centres and the city centre. It will promote the city. Um, it's in trying to establish it as a, as a city break location. Um, obviously, people aren't travelling abroad, um, but staycations are increasingly important. Um, and I think it's also the activity here is going to be providing funding directly to, to local businesses who are going to be involved in, in running these events as well. So there is direct support from the activity. Um, a range or program of uh, activity and events is, is planned over the summer. Uh, these are highlighted in table one of the report. Um, in terms of what the value of this is in terms of input into, into the city, um, in terms of council contributions through ex largely external funding which we've secured, it's around about 700,000, 750,000. There's still some negotiations to be done on some of the activities. But you'll see in promoting this activity, we're having to be very flexible with the funding which we have available. So um, it's not one single council's funding stream. Uh, we're dealing with funding from government through the additional restrictions grants, European funding through the Welcome Back Fund, um, our own two million uh, economic recovery fund, and other pots which we have available as well to deliver this significant program of activity, which hopefully will be a great success um, over the months to come. Um, second part is the Economic Recovery Fund, which you'll be aware was established um, um, before Christmas, a two million pound fund from council resources uh, to support uh, recovery activity, very much from a bottom-up approach with applications being submitted from our communities and from businesses, uh, both um, or large in the district centres and also in, in the city centre as well. And this pa paper sets out the first phase of schemes which have been considered by the steering group and are seeking um, the cooperative executive to endorse uh, those recommendations. Uh, 12 projects in all, although we think we can support six of those with additional restrictions grants, freeing up more money to invest in more locally based schemes as we go forward uh, into the rest of the year. Um, it's also worth noting that the paper uh, seeks um, Councillor Turpin to become chair of the steering group and for Councillor Grocup to become a member of, a, of the, the steering group as well. Um, we've been excited by the, the number of proposals, 80 applications to now be submitted against the, the recovery fund. Uh, some very small, some very large, um, up to £200,000 is, is the maximum level of funding from all parts of the city uh, and from community groups and businesses. So it's been a, it's a very tough uh, process we're putting ourselves through to try and work through these applications. But I think it reflects the fact that, that there is a diverse community out there uh, bringing very good local proposals, which we wouldn't have necessarily thought of as offices. So, so it's been a very uh, good learning experience for us as well. The third area of activity is really just to highlight um, that we'll be utilising um, £520,000 of European funding uh, via the Welcome Back Fund, which, which is additional funding being provided directly from government. Uh, and we've identified areas of intervention which that will be used for. I think one area which has been very successful um, over the past six months, um, and some of you may have met, are business information officers. So these are in effect business advisors who are out on the streets, out on the high streets across um, the district centres, meeting local businesses, helping them through and adapt uh, to COVID, and hopefully now start to actually uh, adapt and, and grow. So the intention is to retain those officers through to March with this funding. As well, the Welcome Back Fund will support some of the outdoor city activity, other events, and, and some marketing campaigns, as I say, the staycation market, and also the Make Yourself at Home campaign, which you've probably seen on some of the uh, placards and notice boards around the city, um, inviting people to come back to the, to the city and to district centres, but behaving safely uh, in, in the way they... Um, move around the city. 
Um, section 1.4.4 just highlights the huge amount of work um, that our offices and business Sheffields have been uh, undertaking over the past um, 13, 14 months, working with the business community, helping them to adapt, survive. It's been a huge undertaking. Thousands of phone calls have been taken over the past 12 months or so, and we continue to support those businesses as best we can with, with a core team of, of staff. Um, I touched on the local additional re restrictions grant. Um, this is funding which has been devolved um, down from the city region, um, albeit funding from, from government. We have an allocation of 1.8 million uh, to use in a discretionary way. Uh, up until now, it's been used to support largely freelancers um, who have not been able to access some of the core grants. Uh, we're now utilizing the balance um, to say to support the outdoor city, but also to look to way if we can use that to stimulate um, new growth, new recovery through potentially investment funds relating to, to green uh, businesses uh, and new starts as well. Um, low carbon business support, there's a, there's a following paper, so I won't, I won't touch on that for now, um, but just to note that it is part of the recovery activity. Um, I, th I think just to highlight um, finally, this, this is a, a, a complex area in terms for officers having to, to, to come up with solutions, not only which uh, satisfy the requirements of, of social distancing, uh, but also stimulate the economy, but also working with a somewhat complicated funding regime um, to, to make sure that we actually deliver the, the best for the city. Um, and the recommendations which are attached to the paper highlight actually a lot of these elements have, have gone through delegated agreements, but we wanted to make sure that the corporate executive was fully aware um, of all the, the activity which has been undertaken, note various changes to who's going to be sitting uh, or involved in some of these areas of funding and activity. Um, and also I think it's important to, to recognise the input at the early stages of the business re recovery group, the private sector partners who are, have really sort of driven um, some of this activity and whose recovery plan we work with has really been sort of the, um, the um, structure for some of these interventions. Thanks, Ben, and, and welcome back, if that's the right thing. And I noticed you didn't have to breathe in once, so hopefully, hopefully the buttons are on the trousers. Um, is there any questions or comments? Jane, then Paul. Jane? Yeah, I, sorry it's late, uh, Chair. Um, I wanted to uh, declare an interest, only because I've just seen that the Broomhill group is on there. I just want for clarification, I have a business in Broomhill, but I am not involved with the group because I'm an elected councillor, so I'm asked not to be involved or receive anything just so there would never be any kind of conflict of interest, but I just wanted that down. But could I just say thank you from people across the city that have approached me to say thank you for how over the pandemic the staff have actually kept everybody in touch and have been so supportive and your work begins now because this is the tough bit but thank you so much but i just wanted to put that on record okay Th th thanks jane thank you paul equally i need to make a declaration of interest as a vice chair of the local charity um thank you ben for the fantastic work you've done with the majority of our businesses but I'm deeply disappointed at how some of the charities have been dealt with. Sheffield stands uniquely in, refu in refusing some of the startup grants to, to charitable institutions, which I've checked with across other local authorities. And I asked Councillor Iqbal to investigate why that was the case in Sheffield when these were to charities in Barnes rather than Wakefield and other areas. And I would certainly like you to look into that because I feel that's very unfair fair than what we're doing. Thank, thank, thank you, Paul. Ben? C certainly, if, if, if you'd like to send through the details, uh, a lot of the decisions uh, we've had to make in terms of some of the grants were dictated by, by the government rules and regulations. I, I think we've all accepted that um, the funding being made available 
meant some very tough choices were had to be made along the way, but certainly I'm more than happy to, to have a look at and see what we can do. Uh, any more questions, comments? If not, then I'd just like to put on, on record our, our thanks as an executive, but also, oh, sorry, Paul, sorry, Paul. Thanks, Chair. Bit, still a bit new, so I'm not sure exactly how it works, but I just wanted to say thanks to Ben, and also um, the person who is missing is Diana Buckley, and she's done amazing and worked late nights and over the bank holiday weekend to produce this report. I think there's a, a great eagerness in, in the, in the uh, department, in the team, to get these grants dealt with and get them out into the hands of the, the people and the businesses that can use them and that need them. And, uh, and I've been absolutely supportive of that. And I'm also pleased to say that we, we've put the green in the green economic recovery with this report. When, and there is a, there's parts in there about the sustainability and the expectations of the recipients of the grants to take into consideration the climate and ecological emergency. Um, yeah, so thanks very much. I'm really pleased that we're getting this over the line. Thanks. Th th thanks, Paul. Uh, and yes, just to underpin, if there's no more, then I, I obviously I want to put on record on behalf of the executive. Our, our thanks, Ben. Obviously, it's not been easy to get that, but I mean, the welcoming of the two million of the economic recovery fund and also the 520,000 of the welcome back fund. And, and as you say, there's a list of events on the summer in the outdoor city here, you know, just going through them of the continuation of the reopening safely of the city centre, the executive, members of the executive went on a walkabout on Monday, looking at some of the measures that are, are going in there. We also have spoke to the chamber uh, with businesses in this city about the welcoming, the, the way that we, we go around that. There's the cliffhanger event. There's also the fringe uh, at, at tram lines. We've also got the large scale uh, programme of animation I'm really interested in the El Fresco Avenue, but we'll see how that, how, how that goes up on Division Street uh, and the staycation. But also the one that I really, really value is the Armed Forces Day on the, on the 3rd of July, when, when the veterans, the men and women who have served us, get a chance to come into the city and, and, and sample what we've got on offer. So it's a real opportunity, Ben. Thank you. Thank you very much for the team to put, put this package together. There's a number of recommendations uh, members on this report, can we agree then? Thank you. Thanks so much. Item nine, um, I think it's you again, Ben. Sheffield City Region Low Carbon Business Support. Uh, yes, Us. thank you. Yeah, yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, I can take credit for this one because I did actually write uh, this paper, um, and I will pass on. My, my gratitude to not just Diana, but, but the teams uh, who've been heavily involved in the previous paper. Um, it's been hard, hard work, um, but as, as it says, more to do. Um, this paper uh, puts forward a proposal for the council to uh, deliver a low carbon business support project um, supported with a grant of European funding of 1.3 million pounds um, and which will deliver um, support across South Yorkshire. Um, so it's not just Sheffield-based activity. Um, the report is in response to funding being made available um, through the current European programme to support low-carbon interventions, um, but more fundamentally reflects um, the, the need, fairly obvious need, um, to deal with climate change, which is reflected in various uh, policy documents, both uh, nationally, regionally, and locally. Uh, and this project has directly tried to address some of those issues by targeting the business community uh, in terms of improving uh, their, their climate uh, performance. I think it's, it's a relatively uh, low value project in the scheme of things and, and, and what we have to achieve as a city, um, let alone uh, globally. Um, but this is seen as, I think, potentially as a first step and more as an educational program than a grant program for businesses. A key part of the intervention is the appointment of specialist uh, business support consultants who will be able to go and meet uh, businesses. We've identified 260 as a minimum. I suspect they'll be interacting with more businesses than that. And as part of that process, 
uh, they will be put, those businesses will be provided with a three, uh, three in terms of cost, uh, energy audit, uh, which will identify relatively straightforward interventions uh, a small or medium enterprise business can take to improve their environmental credentials by reducing their energy needs, whether that's through energy production, um, energy saving measures, or indeed looking at some of their waste management and water management issues as well. So a fairly broad range of interventions will be identified by the audit, and that will then lead for an ability for a business who's, who's um, received an audit to apply for a grant of up to 50% towards the cost of, of providing um, interventions against the audit, uh, audit measures which have been identified by, by the process. Um, not huge grants, we're only talking up to, to £20,000, um, potentially 25 of a maximum, but those measures do make a difference. Um, we anticipate the majority of those will be simple, like putting LED lights uh, into a building, improving energy performance, reducing draft, um, or potentially looking at pr um, some of the, their equipment needs and, and energy performance of equipment. So relatively small scale interventions, but ones which importantly pay back quite quickly. And obviously that's part of selling the whole process of, of investing in a business and a green way of working is actually, it hits the bottom line. So this project also has a fairly fundamental point of improving productivity of the businesses who benefit uh, from, from the interventions. The, the final element of, of, of the project is, is promoting the scheme itself, promoting um, green interventions by businesses, and, and, and that shouldn't be um, undermined uh, or undervalued, rather, in any way at all. So it's, it's a, a relatively straightforward intervention across, across the city region. The council is being asked to uh, act as the accountable body, um, so we will, um, in effect, run the program on behalf of all four South Yorkshire local authorities, we will be entering into the contract with um, MHCLG through European funding, and we will be ensuring that the match funding, which is largely driven by the private sector through their investment into their own businesses, uh, will be secured in, in a uh, accurate way and compliant way. Um, I won't go through all the, the legal and financial issues associated with paper, other to say that they're long and lengthy because we are dealing with European funding, um, what I can say is we, we are well versed in, in this now, so hopefully that put your minds at rest that, that we know what we're doing uh, with European funding. Um, and hopefully it'll be a fairly straightforward um, program of activity from that perspective. I think from, from my team side uh, and the economic development team side, this is almost like a no-brainer scheme to deliver. Um, the funding's in place. It's ticking two boxes in terms of economic growth and recovery but equally as important, it's ticking the sustainability box as well. Um, and as, as far as we're concerned, we think it, it's a really good project to just get on and, and do. So I'd welcome um, the um, corporate executives' um, support of our recommendations. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ben. Any questions, comments, Douglas? Uh, thanks, yes, so, so two comments really, um, both positive. Absolutely happy to endorse this. This is absolutely the right thing that we need to be doing as a whole city or as a whole region to tackle uh, climate change. It's not just what we're doing within the council, but about getting out and helping businesses there. So really pleased to see that. And I think the, one of the important things you said there, Ben, was about how actually quite small grants can make a big difference. Um, there's actually so much that can be done in terms of you know, easy wins uh, within businesses if we just give them that nudge and a small amount of cash do that. So this is you know, absolutely spot on. And the second thing I just wanted to commend you and the other officers for, Ben, is the fact of taking this initiative. And, and you noted recorded at paragraph 5.1 of the report that the region had looked at delivering this and decided it didn't really have the confidence to do so. And I'm actually really glad this council has picked that baton up and run with it because it, it, the, the climate emergency is obviously too important to just not take up these op opportunities when they're here. It's really important that we support our businesses um, and tackle the climate crisis. So go for it. Thank you very much. Th thanks, Douglas. Paul? 
Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, ben, thanks again. Great work. Um, I can't take any credit for this at all because it was just there, basically waiting for me to take my post. And all I really did was say, yeah, go for it with uh, as, as quickly and with as much gusto as you can. And um, But this kind of um, uh, funding it is really important. And um, I think it's... I really hope it is going to make Sheffield small local businesses more resilient to the challenges of the climate emergency, and it's and it's also really part of my ambition to uh, upskill Sheffield in regards to carbon literacy and and just make people and business more fluent in the terms of the climate emergency, um, so we can deal with it best and really work together to hit our. Uh, 2030 target of being carbon neutral. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank, thanks, Paul. Uh, anybody else? If not, I'd just like to reiterate what's been said. I think, as, as, as we said, it's small-scale interventions, but it's a massive project, and also it's how we work across the region as well, uh, pulling these projects together. So there's a number of recommendations in the report. Can we agree, then? Agreed? Thank you. Um, Stop there then, Ben. Obviously, item 10, uh, the Stocksbridge Towns Fund. Uh, yeah, the last one for me. You'll be glad to hear. Um, this paper is, provides uh, mainly an update to, to the members of, of the executive in respect to the Stocksbridge Town Fund. Um, I think the key point to, to note is that uh, um, the application for funding in relation to the town investment plan was submitted to government and, and approved, which has confirmed uh, an initial allocation of £24.1 million for a series of projects which still require further development uh, to take place uh, in, in Stocksbridge itself. Um, importantly, those schemes are being developed by the town's board uh, in consultation with the local community. Um, and that's very much the principle we as a council and officers want to maintain working with the community uh, and the town's board to ensure that uh, those 10 projects are delivered in, in the best way possible, uh, utilising the funding which has now been available. Um, I think it's, it's key to note uh, in that context that, that the paper, um, if it's the right way around from my perspective, um, highlights the next stage which is to develop uh, 10 business cases from what were um, fairly brief outline proposals, which were submitted to, to government back in January, uh, to now um, pretty much near full business cases, uh, which will then be submitted to government for final sign-off. Um, all those business cases uh, relate to the, the original 10 schemes, which are highlighted in, in section 1.2.5 of the report. And you can see there's a, there's a flavor of activity there, um, all of which is, is capital because town's funding is capital, a small amount for revenue, but, but basically uh, capital interventions, which are looking at transport, improving um, the high street in Stocksbridge, educational programs and, uh, and health and well-being activity as well. So, so a range of interventions which are then hoping to, to um, deliver against the vision which the um, Towns Board developed, um, highlighted in the, the paragraph uh, above, which is very much about ensuring that local people benefit through, through the interventions, and, and, and that's key to the activity. The main element of this paper, apart from an update, is to highlight the need for the council to provide uh, initially one and a half million pounds of uh, funding to develop those 10 business cases. Um, it's anticipated that um, those projects will be approved and, and actually the funding will be uh, reimbursed to the council. Um, so we are being asked to, in effect, cash a flow um, the development process uh, up until March. Um, but we need to highlight um, that there is an element of risk that should some of those projects fail, uh, then we may not be able to secure uh, some, some of that funding. I, th I think that will be a negotiation with government over, over the next uh, nine months. But they're well aware of the issue in terms of asking local authorities for all towns funds to, to, to um, prepare projects at risk. Um, 
I'm hoping they'll, they'll take that into account should, should we have face any issues with the projects themselves. Um, I think the, the other point to notice, which, which isn't um, specifically identified in the report, is um, that um, by May, May this year, um, government did actually award an additional half a million pounds uh, of accelerated funding to deliver improvements to the uh, Oxley Park. Those works have now finished, um, or as far as I'm aware, but pretty much finished. Um, so um, the start of activity in Doxbury structures has, has begun. It's not a case of now waiting for those business cases. The interventions have, have seen uh, improvements being taken already. Um, I think that's, that's all I need to say on this paper. As I say, it's, it's largely an update, noting the um, 1.5 million, and also uh, just making uh, the executive aware that the council will be looking to submit uh, an application from funding from Sheffield City Region to support um, some acquisitions which may be required as part of delivering one or two of the projects uh, and we'll be obviously entering into negotiations with landowners uh, to secure those properties as part of the, the project delivery process. Fantastic. Thank you, Ben. Any questions, comments, Paul? Thanks again, Chair. Um, yeah, uh, this is just such an exciting project and uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully a tour from Councillor Grove Cop at some point. Um, and I just wanted to, to um, say it, it's also, it's another example of, of how the recovery is going to be a green recovery. And we got the very important line in there to deliver clean growth. And I hope that that really I'm really hopeful and optimistic that it will mean that the project doesn't have an adverse effect on the climate and ecological emergency. And actually, it can be an exemplar of what can be achieved uh, that can be exciting and it can develop the economy, but it can also be clean and green. And I'm also very much looking forward to having a go on the funicular. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sir. Uh, Councillor Grocco. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Sirkin, you're welcome any time to come to Stocksbridge and have a wander around. It's a, um, a fantastic district centre. I think it's a great project that's been put together. Um, the beauty of it is the council and board is, is run and managed by local people who understand the community, who are invested in doing the right thing for the town. Um, the town sits on the edge of the Peak District and the big driver for driving this project forward is to recover the local economy, doing that playing to our strengths, which of course is the beautiful countryside that we're surrounded by and linking into the outdoor city model that we've had for this city for a long time as our unique selling point. So um, there's some great links locally, there's some great links um, to the wider city and how we see the city developing, which I think are to be... Um, to be welcomed, and um, I hope to see you all on the funicular. Thank you, Chair. All right, thanks, Julie. Any, any more questions, comments? If not, I'd just like to welcome this report. Uh, you know, it's it's great when we see what local people do together. I know they've, they've been all over that. And for officers, uh, the officers who have been working on this project, it's a real credit to them to get, to get this over the line. Um, and obviously, uh, I understand that the local councillors have been all over it like a rash. Uh, Councillor Grocott and, and Councillor Francine Johnson. So it's a credit for them. Obviously, it fits in superbly with our executive agreement going forward of delivering for our communities and putting Sheffield first. So uh, on the recommendations in this report, can we welcome that? Can we approve those recommendations? Agreed. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, the, the final agenda item is item 11. Uh, and it's the extension to the alternative provider framework. Uh, presenting officer, is it Kevin? Over to you, Kevin. Thank you, sir. My name is Kevin Strawn. I'm the head of lifelong learning skills and employment. Um, and the purpose of the report today is an extension to the um, alternative education provider framework for an additional year from uh, July 21 through to July 22. Um, the, the, the framework itself is, is a really important part of our provision and it allows us to deliver the alternative um, 
education provision for the most vulnerable young children in our school system um, in the city. Uh, we do this through a range of alternative providers who are community-based organizations across the city who provide this service. Um, it, it's worth saying as well at this point that um, they work with 400 plus of the most vulnerable young children in, the, in our city who, who are facing serious barriers to their um, engagement in education and provide 500 places throughout an academic year. Um, and there are only 25 um, provider organisations in the city who do this and it's absolutely a tremendous piece of work that they do. And it is worth saying at this point as well that they've worked right through the pandemic um, providing that service for the most vulnerable young people and have done a tremendous service during that time. Um, the, the provider framework will provide a, a due diligence system which ensures that the, the, the children are placed in organisations that are able to work within our procurement rules and will also be subject to um, ongoing quality and contractual intervention throughout the year um, that they're providing this provision. The, the framework is a call-off framework, so we call uh, for providers to engage in the framework, then we commission the most appropriate provider on an individual basis for the children according to their particular um, needs and requirements. What Sheffield City Council provide the, um, provide the contract management for this particular service and we act as a broker between the school and the provider and, and that's a very important part of this provision. And we have a statutory duty under Section 19 of the Education Act to provide this service. Um, and, it, and it has a very important role to play in terms of our schools having access to provision. Originally, the intention was to um, have a new framework in place for academic year 21-22. The present framework has been in place since 2017. Uh, but because of the impact of COVID, and also a, a, a changing requirement around the type of provision we provide as an alternative uh, provision. Um, we're, we're asking really to extend the framework for that additional year to allow us to do some really detailed analytical work to deliver um, an improved framework for, from academic year 22 onwards for a, for a longer period of time. Um, we're, we're conscious of the fact that we provide a framework that is based upon engagement and enrichment and that we need to do much more academic delivery particularly around STEM subjects for young children who are unable to go to school. So the additional work that we will do during the extended year is really looking at what that provision needs to look like to meet the needs of children who are, who are um, engaged in education other than in school during that key time. Um, the framework gives head te teachers the opportunity to give children time out from school, to give them an alternative place to learn and give them time to um, realign behaviours, attitudes and engagement and return them to school. So it provides that really important function for head teachers to ensure that, that children can maintain engagement in school. In terms of uh, equal opportunities, we, we, we did a, a, an assessment um, for you the, the, the real issue here around uh, equal opportunities and e e equality and, and, and the intervention is that the, ch the children who engage in this are particularly vulnerable and therefore it has a marked impact upon their education engagement both in school but also on their transition opportunities in uh, post-16 education when, when they get to that particular point. The, the provision... Um, turns over about £750,000 a year. Um, it's, it's actually cost neutral because the schools pay the provider for delivery and we act as the middle as the middleman in terms of providing the service and channeling the funding uh, through to the provider from the school. Um, we, we only charge a very small nominal fee um, to cover the, the costs of officers' time. It, it ranges between two and seven pounds for that um, brokerage service depending upon how much work has to be done. The intention is to use the present framework that's already in place and simply extend it. So we already have the commercial model in terms of going out for the call-off order for, for provision. So all of that's already in place. We won't be altering that at all. We'll simply be extending that framework for additional, an, an additional year. Um, 
the, the, the important thing with the, the framework passing through Sheffield City Council is that it's regulated and safe and it provides schools with a security that the provider is working within the safeguarding frameworks and that the quality of provision is managed by my team and we're able to ensure that it's of the highest quality and that's really important in, in terms of this provision. So the, the recommendations are that we, we move to a, a extended framework for a year that will provide uh, consistency in terms of the quality of education um, and that will provide an important provision for schools and, and for the young people themselves. It will give us the additional year in which we can focus in on doing that particular and important review of the provision that we already have in place and building a new and improved provision from academic year 22 onwards. Um, and it, it also gives us an opportunity to do some real evaluation of need with that particular cohort of learners. And we intend to use that time as well to look deeply at our alternative provision in terms of the wider picture, all of that activity that goes on outside of the school itself, looking at the work of Sheffield Inclusion Centre, looking at the work of hospital education and making sure that we've got those intrinsic tied up links around providing a real quality service and good education for children who are unable to access it at school. Thank you, sir. Th thanks, Kevin. Uh, any questions? Comments? Jane? Thank you, and I'd like to thank um, the officers for the hard work. Um, you might be last on the agenda, but you're certainly not least. I mean, we've heard some marvellous things today about the COVID recovery and how well Sheffield's done. Um, this is about human. This is about the kids. And to me, this is what it's really, really about, is the fact that they really do need our support to get through this recovery. They needed it before. And I want to thank you for all the work you've done during the pandemic, uh, doing this. I think it's right that I'm looking forward to shaping it along with my um, rest of my, the members here today is to make sure that the children get the full benefits of moving forward so they're not disenfranchised because every child in this city has been disenfranchised through the pandemic but these more so than anyone so um, I think this is really really important and I look forward to helping you move forward with it. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Any more questions, comments? If not, can I say thank you, Kevin, for you and the team. I look forward to get seeing the new framework. Well, hopefully we can get it on the forward plan as soon as possible so that, so that the executive can, can talk through, obviously, the announcement for one more year. But it'd be good to see what the, the thoughts and the processes going forward are for this alternative provision. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Kevin. And there's nothing else on the agenda, so can I thank everybody for attending today. Uh, look forward to seeing the next meeting will be on Wednesday the 23rd of June at 2pm. So look forward to seeing you then. Thank you very much. Bye.